Probably one of the most underrated locations for fishing are small streams and rivers. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to get the best out of those locations and catch more fish. During the warmer months of the year, fish's metabolism is high and they're very active. They're always looking for food and can be quite easy to catch. However, when the temperatures begin to drop in winter, uh, the fish will tend to slow right down and won't feed so actively. Another problem in winter is that large rivers can often be flooded. Uh, and it is for this reason that when the winter comes, Alex and I tend to turn our attentions to small streams and rivers. Reason being, Fish that are swimming against the flow all the time are continuing to burn energy and therefore they still need to feed, which can make rivers and streams more productive in winter than uh, still waters. When you're fishing uh, streams or rivers, the species that you're probably most likely to encounter are as follows. Chub, a silvery fish which will happily eat almost any bait you throw in the water. Perch, a predatory fish which eats worms, small fish, that sort of thing. Roach, a shy biting and often very easily spooked river fish. Barbel, a hard fighting, beautiful species, a bit harder to find, but some rivers do have decent numbers of them. There is of course many, many other species that you may come across, but those are probably the four most popular target species as it were. Local to us, there are probably three or four flowing water locations, ranging from medium to small rivers, right down to basically drainage channels. Over the next few minutes, we're going to cover the tactics that we like to use to get the most out of these sorts of locations. So first of all, there is float fishing. This is a tactic which lends itself most to even flowing uh, rivers with a similar sort of depth. You need uh, to look for a swim which has got a decent length to let the float run down, but you also need to find an area of the river that is of fairly consistent depth. That's because once you set your float, it trots down the river um, and you want to have a decent length of water to, to float, float fish through. Uh, if the water is very shallow and then it goes very deep and then very shallow again, that float will just sort of drag on the shallow bits and won't fish effectively in the deeper bits. If you're choosing to float fish, then here is a look at the floats that we would advise using. First of all, there is the stick float. This is the pattern of float that we tend to use for most small streams and rivers. If the water is very fast and it's boiling over and maybe a little bit deeper, uh, really moving through quite quickly, uh, a loafer float or chubber style float is more suitable as these are more buoyant, they're thicker, it's easier to control them, uh, easier to control them, sorry, in fast flows and also they hold a lot more shot, which means you can get your bait down to the bottom in those faster, more turbulent currents. If you want more information on setting up a float rig, getting your split shot in the right place and choosing the right floats, we've actually made a video uh, on the Fishing Tutorials channel. We will link that down below and we'll also put a link to it at the end of this video. We definitely advise watching that if you want to learn more specifically about float fishing. As far as feeding is concerned, when we're float fishing, the best bait we've found is just maggots. A little pinch of maggots tossed around the float, maybe every other cast, make one cast, let it go through. And when you make your next one, chuck a little pinch of maggots out. Those maggots as loose feed will draw more fish into the area and try and get them feeding. Also, if you keep those fish looking for maggots as they flutter down through the swim, uh, they're less likely to become spooky and, uh, and back off. If you can keep them looking for that loose feed, hunting it in the flow, then you'll keep the bites coming uh, for a longer period of time. The trick with float fishing on flowing water is to get the right depth. Having it set very, very shallow in very deep water will probably mean you miss out on those fish near the bottom. Likewise, if you set your float way too deep, the hook will just catch on the bottom and you'll get snagged on stuff all the time uh, and you won't be presenting effectively. To find the depth on a river, we just like to make sure there's no um, bait on the hook. It just means that if the float goes under, then it's dragging along the bottom and it hasn't been taken by a fish. We take the bait off of the hook, set it to the depth we guess that it is, cast it in. If we run that float down and it drags under, then it's probably set too deep because the hook is catching on the bottom. If we run the float down through the swim and the float stays on the surface and never bobs or drags under at all, then it's probably too shallow. Uh, that just means that the hook isn't catching on anything on the bottom. Have a little play around, adjust your depth until you're trotting it down through the swim and it's not dragging under, but it's also not set really, really shallow. 
Putting maggots straight onto the hook is great, and a red and a white maggot on the hook has done us loads and loads of fish over the years. However, if you're trying to search through those smaller fish, and find something a bit bigger, then you could try a larger hook and a worm on the hook. Uh, you could also try using a piece of bread. On the topic of bread, a good way to uh, loose feed if you haven't got any maggots is just to take a load of bread, stick it in a bucket and mush it up with a load of water. That sort of mushed up sloppy bread uh, can be a good fish attractor if you can't get your hands on any maggots. Another alternative, if you've got bread at home and you've got a food processor, just blitz it up, make it into breadcrumb and toss out gently squeezed balls of breadcrumb into the swim. That's a great way to attract fish as well, especially if you're using bread on the hook. That sort of combination works really well for chub. If the location that you want to fish just doesn't really lend itself to float fishing, let's say it's very, very shallow and then there's these little pools which are quite deep, um, you're not going to be able to run a float through that very easily. In those situations, we like to fish with a ledgered bait. Ledgering is the word given to describe fishing with a weight uh, on your line that pulls your bait all the way to the bottom and anchors it on the deck. Ledgering or feeder fishing tends to be the way we like to approach waters where we want to try and get through to some bigger fish. It's a bit of a generalization because you can catch big fish on the float as well but if you just want to sit there and wait for a big char, big barbel, maybe even a perch then fishing with a worm on a ledger on the deck is normally the best way to do this. The reason being is because smaller hungrier fish uh, will often chase uh, maggots and bread and stuff that's falling through uh, up in the water but the bigger fish will often sit on the bottom wait for the bait that comes through hits the bottom and they'll feed on that bigger fish tend to be a bit more lazy they just want to you know feed around on, on the bottom and ledgering is a great way to target those larger specimens so now I'm going to show you how to set up a simple rig for fishing down on the bottom first of all you will need the following items a micro swivel a guru speed bead some hook link material, this is four pound breaking strain, a size 12 hook, and some split shot. Take a micro swivel and tie a short length of line to it. Thread the swivel onto your main line and then tie on a Guru speed bead. This bead will enable you to switch hook and hook link quickly. Now take some line of a lower breaking strain than your main line. For this rig we are using 6 pound main line and a 4 pound hook link. Tie a size 12 hook to one end with a half blood knot. We have a playlist on our channel with a load of how to tie fishing knots if you need help with these. At the other end tie a figure of 8 loop knot. Then take that loop and attach it to the speed bead like this. Pinch on some split shot to that short piece of line. You can add or remove shot where necessary to give yourself enough weight to get your bait to the bottom and hold there. In faster flowing water, you'll find you need to pinch on more split shot. There you have it a running rig which provides good bite indication when a fish takes the bait. If you find yourself in a slower moving swim, you can take a couple of the split shots off and still hold bottom effectively. It's best to try and use the least amount of weight possible for least disturbance when you cast and also the best bite indication. 
The size 12 hook that we use with this rig is perfect for a worm or a bunch of maggots. However, if you want to use a chunk of bread or a piece of spam, for example, use a larger hook. However, if you want to use just a couple of maggots, scale the hook right down to something like a size 16. The rig that we've just shown is what we tend to use on small streams where we want to fish in a deep pool, anchor a bait on the bottom, sit back and have a little bit of patience. That said, you shouldn't be too patient when fishing on small rivers. Reason being is fish do move around and if there's hungry fish in front of you on a small stream or river, you probably will get a bite quite quickly. If you're sitting there with absolutely nothing and there's miles of river um, ahead of you, then it's definitely worth packing light moving swims regularly and trying to find where those fish are shoaled up. If you're choosing to fish in one spot for a little while and watch the quiver tip, it can be quite helpful to use a bank stick. That just means that you're not knocking the rod, you don't have to hold it, and you can see bites uh, on the rod tip very easily. However, alternatively, if you're moving swims more regularly or even stalking the fish, you may want to just hold the rod at all times and feel for bites. A little pluck on the rod tip is enough to know that a fish has taken your bait and it's time to strike. If you're casting at fish that you can see, um, hunting them down, stalking, then you can fish a rig as simple as just one or two split shot pinched on about six inches from your hook. For this style of fishing, we'll often use bread or spam on the hook, and we've actually had some of our best ever barbell and chub sessions fishing on small streams, spotting the fish, creeping up on them really quietly, and just bumping the bait through uh, in front of them. When choosing a spot to fish on a small river, the most important thing to look for is depth. If you've got 100 meters of six inch deep shallow water and then it drops off into a deep pool, you can bet you're gonna find most fish in that deep pool. Fish just really feel more comfortable if they've got a bit of depth of water over their heads. Another thing to look for is the speed of that water. Fish like barbel and chub are very streamlined in shape and will happily sit in that fast flowing water waiting for you know, food items to come down. More deeper bodied species like perch, uh, bream, roach, those fish you will normally find in slightly slower moving waters. Uh, some people refer to them as slacks. Slack water is basically any area of the river that is moving quite slowly. What you'll normally find is on a bend of a river, the water on the outside of that bend is running quite fast because the, the force of the flow will push it across to the outside of the bend. However, on the inside of that bend, there'll sometimes be like a back eddy of more gentle flowing slacker water. That slack is where you want to look uh, when you're fishing for roach, perch, bream. However, the faster, more powerful water is definitely where you want to be if you're looking for a uh, chub, barbel, that sort of thing. Whilst still talking about the pace of the water, there's one more thing that you should probably look for when fishing on any uh, flowing water, and that is the crease. It won't always be easy to find where the crease is, but the crease is basically the bit where the fast flowing water meets the slower flowing water. You can sometimes see it on larger rivers, on very small waterways, you probably won't be able to find it, but that area is where that fast water mixes with the slow water. Fish will often sit just within the slow water and only come out of it to uh, intercept bits of food washing down in that quicker area. Um, the crease is a really great area to, to target basically any species and it's definitely worth a cast if you can find it. Another thing to look for when trying to locate fish is cover. Basically if a fish feels safe, it feels like it can hide away and not be seen, then that's where they're going to want to be. So overhanging trees, uh, tree roots, undercut banks are amazing. Where that water like, eats away at the margin, sometimes the bank can be quite undercut and fish, especially chub, like to sit right underneath there where they can tuck away and not be seen by anyone. Basically, if you turn up at a river, it's clear and you don't know where the fish are gonna be, they will be hiding somewhere where you can't see them. So an undercut bank, a deep little hole, or an area where there's some lily pads or weed or something where they can hide, is definitely where you're gonna find uh, fish of all species. Lastly, don't ignore man-made structure like bridges, weirs, uh, lock gates, tunnels, that sort of thing. Those structures are places where the fish can get away from potential predators like herons or cormorants. Also, rivers that flow through towns will often have a high density of fish in, the, in that town area. 
um, the, the presence of people will often put off birds like cormorants or predators like mink and otters. Uh, so rivers that flow through towns or cities can often be full of fish, uh, particularly in the winter when they are more susceptible to predation. On small and particularly clear rivers, fish will often spook quite badly when you catch one. You will bait up a spot, the fish will start feeding, you'll hook one, it will splash around and spook the others, and you probably, once you put that fish back after taking a photo, might not get another bite from that area for a little while. Uh, if the water's murky, the fish won't get so scared of one of their you know, friends being caught and released in the same area, but if it's a very small river and very clear, your chances of getting a second bite in that same spot become a lot, lot smaller. In most cases, if Alex and I are fishing a very small river, we catch one uh, and it's quite clear water, those fish are probably spooked. What we'll actually do, rather than casting in again, is we'll actually just chuck some bait in and move elsewhere. We'll go fish some other spots, give it an hour, maybe two hours, come back and then fish that spot again once the fish have got their confidence back up and once they're feeding again. Overall, we like to bring the absolute least amount of tackle possible when fishing on uh, rivers. The reason why is because a river is very long, you want to fish a decent number of different spots along that river throughout the course of the day, and if you've brought loads of tackle with you, it will be harder to move swims. You will feel less inclined to walk because you know, your gear is heavy. Uh, on the topic of tackle, the particular items that we like to bring with us depends on the style of fishing that we're going to be doing. If we're float fishing on a very small river, then a 10 or 11 foot float rod is absolutely perfect. If it's a bigger river, then like a 12 or even 13 foot float rod is more suited. But if you're gonna just buy one rod, probably best to go for something relatively short, like 10 or 11 foot. Reason being, trying to use a long float rod is very clumsy if you're on a small river. However, you can get away with a shorter rod on a larger river. A uh, couple of places close to where we fish, a 12 or 13 foot rod, you're just getting caught in the trees. You just, you know, the rod's too long. You're dropping the bait on the opposite side of the bank. Lots of the places we fish are very, very small waterways and a 10 or 11 foot float rod is absolutely perfect. If you're going to be ledgering or feeder fishing, watching the rod tip for bites, uh, a quiver tip rod is what you need to look for. Something with a very sensitive, light colored tip is absolutely ideal so that you can see when you receive a bite. Again, 10 or 11 foot's a perfect length. Uh, and the only time we'll use something else other than a float or feeder rod is if we're fishing somewhere very, very small. Uh, there's certain spots, very overgrown spots, tiny little streams where you're actually better off having a rod of about six or seven foot, maybe eight foot at most. When we're using a very short rod like that, we tend to use a ultralight drop shot rod or a, you know, a lure fishing rod designed for perch fishing or something. Those very, very short little rods are more suited to creeping around fishing very close into the bank uh, and fishing sort of overgrown places. So it's worth considering if a lot of the places near you are very small, try looking at drop shot or lure rods. They can be really well suited to um, you know, very, very small waterways. Whether we are float or feeder fishing, the reel we like to use is a small fixed spool variety. Some people like to use center pins or closed face reels, however, they are a little bit harder to get used to. And for any beginner, I definitely recommend a fixed spool reel. On the spool, uh, I would advise four to six pound line. If you're going for larger fish like barbel, then you probably want to go with eight or even 10 pound uh, line. If they're big barbel, you know, 12 pound line, like they fight incredibly hard. But most of our small stream fishing uh, is revolved around using probably six pound line on the reel. That's a good place to start. For fish care purposes, you'll need to use uh, an unhooking mat and also a landing net. The net that we've got is a small uh, pan net variety which screws onto a, a landing net handle. It's very lightweight, easy to move swims, and we fit some pretty big fish in that net. It might not look very big, but we've had fish over 12 pounds in it. Um, so that works great. Along with your unhooking mat, you'll also want to bring a rod rest if you're fishing static and you're not moving swims too often, and a, a, a rucksack uh, just to keep your terminal tackle in. Some people will like to bring a chair with them. However, we tend not to bring a chair uh, river fishing with us because it hinders our likelihood of moving swims. Packing as light as possible uh, and being mobile is absolutely key. 
River fishing can be very rewarding and actually quite surprising at times. Alex and I, and indeed some of our friends, have caught some really quality fish out of waterways, tiny little streams that most people would probably not even think fish could live in. Anyway, if this video has interested you, definitely check out the float fishing tutorial to hone your skills on float fishing. And in the meantime, good luck and we'll see you next time.